I'm Scott Taylor, as she said. I think she covered most of this stuff. Uh, I'm Wonder Boy Music on pretty much every social music platform. Um, the story behind that, I always tell it because people don't know, is uh, it was a fake booking agency for my band. So I would, I would always send uh, mail as Wonder Boy Music. Uh, anyways, I live in New York, and I've been working at the New York Times, I guess, for um, two and a half years now. Uh, before that, I met a lot of you for the first time at WordCamp San Francisco in 2011. Um, I was at a company called eMusic then. I was there for about five and a half years. Um, yeah, so WordPress at the New York Times now has um, some legacy blogs. We uh, it used to be a much bigger um, blogging ecosystem there, and I'll I'll go into some of the history of you know where WordPress has come from and going to the New York Times. But we have some legacy blogs. Uh, Lens is our photography blog. It's a WordPress property. First Draft is the Washington Bureau's sort of daily live stream, and it's a, um, a newsletter that comes in your email every day. Um, we use it for some internal corporate sites that aren't very cool. Um, <laughs> uh, NYT Co., which is the sort of uh, brand site, uh, Women in the World, or Women, yeah, so it should be Women in the World, that's uh, not correct, but it's a conference site. Um, Tina Brown has this um, conferences program that highlights women, and that's, that's a joint partnership with the New York Times. Um, Times Journeys, which if anybody knows Eric Lewis, uh, he was a contractor for us before he started working at the Times. And he built out Times Journeys, which is kind of like this travel cruise website, New York Times branded thing. Uh, check it out if you have some time. Uh, and then we do something called the live coverage platform, which is the reason we're sitting here today. And in the future, um, I'd say within a couple months, we're going to start launching um, some international based projects um, that are going to use WordPress as the platform. A lot of people ask, how does the New York Times do WordPress? And this is literally. Um, right now, like the, the main goalpost for that. But um, the live coverage platform is what I want to kind of talk about. Uh, as was mentioned, I've been leading WordPress 4.4. I know a lot of you keep track of that, so I'm not even going to spend a lot of time talking about this. But these are some of the banner features that are happening in WordPress 4.4. Um, REST API is half in. It's the infrastructure where you can create your own endpoints. And that was the part that actually interests me the most. And the way I use it at the New York Times is mostly registering custom endpoints, so that's fine by me. But a lot of people uh, make client apps, and those are slated for a future release. Um, it's not safe to say 4.5 yet, but uh, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, who knows. Um, responsive images are pretty cool, if you've never heard of them. Uh, WordPress is an embed provider, and then tons of under the hood stuff. So. Uh, in the coming days, you'll see lots of press about WordPress 4.4, so I'm not going to use the time now to talk about that. And I think uh, it'll get addressed tomorrow in the state of the word. Um, but yeah, so when I came to the New York Times, my job was to be on the blogs team. Uh, the New York Times has about 400 people in technology, and um, blogs team was just one of several teams that works on making parts of the New York Times. Um, the New York Times used WordPress very early. Um, they were also an early investor in Automatic. Uh, and they were one of the first users of multi-site, I think in a highly visible way. Um, at the height of blog mania at the Times, which I'd say was uh, nine or 10 years ago, to where um, WordPress was really this uh, modern spaceship of a technology that allowed people to uh, move fast and launch um, new properties quickly. There was about 80 blogs that were active. Um, and many, many of the blogs, even as far back as 2008, used live blogging. Um, so when I arrived, the blog's code base was a completely separate code base from the rest of the New York Times. Um, a lot of the New York Times actually is built on PHP, but it's in the camp of no framework at all. Or the frameworks they do use would be proprietary. Um, and it was kind of a strange. Um, environment we were in because the blog still looked a lot like the New York Times, um, but they weren't in the same code base. So the way that happened was sharing a lot of CSS and JavaScript 
Um, and so the blogs would kind of import this global CSS, and then there'd be this blogs global CSS, and then there'd be specific blog CSS. And the fun part was that it wasn't all in the same place. It was actually across like seven different SVN repos. Um, so you were kind of working in this keyhole blog environment, but you were very affected by the rest of the New York Times um, styles and code base. It was also a universe that assumed in perpetuity that jQuery and prototype would, would live on in harmony forever. Um, and when I first saw the code base, I, I think this is how I decided to phrase it, challenging amounts of what could generously be called technical debt. Uh, it was a strange uh, history of the World Wide Web. So uh, <laughs> a simple way to say this, uh, this is a simple example of the kind of stuff you would see um, in the markup of these pages, but there's prototype up there, and we have our friend jQuery, and then somewhere within the markup, we're gonna have something that does jQuery and something that does prototype. Um, what could possibly go wrong here? I mean, you know, not much, right? Well, a, a lot of things. So, uh, there were some uh, less than good practices that were happening. Um, there was inline HTML in 2008 that was being saved in the post content, and um, that, 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 that becomes a bad thing when prototype goes out of style and you have prototype inline code in your posts. Um, there were widgets in inline code that would add their own version of jQuery or prototype, which was helpful. And then um, you would actually sometimes receive code from another team. Um, you know, WordPress is very extensible with stuff like widget areas. And so uh, the interactive, interactive news team might give us a, a newsletter widget that we'd, we would put into our um, sidebar that would have its own version of jQuery. Um, so I mean, at times you would have stuff like this. You know, you'd have whatever the top one was, and who knows what version was actually out at this point, but you know, we, we were locked into 162 for religious reasons, I guess. Uh, and we have 171. There's this video code that, believe it or not, has jQuery and prototype in it as well, which is pretty cool. And then um, at the bottom, we have this namespace jQuery. I actually don't know where the namespace happened, but I, I, need, I know you had to use that. And that was the one that meant it was the right one. Um, so the problem here, um, from a conceptual standpoint, I, almost not even worrying about the details, is that uh, we have two projects and we have no shared modules. So the New York Times is a website that's gonna have a header and a footer, and the blogs is gonna have a header and a footer. Ideally, there'd be some scenario where there, it was the same header and footer, but typically it was not. Um, that stuff can get out of, out of sync immediately. So if you have a separate project, that's gonna change their code, unless you're constantly you know, looking at their GitHub repo, uh, or sorry, SVN repo, you're not, you're not gonna have much fun. Um, and like I said, the CSS and JavaScript was split across, I think, like seven different repos. So to even run the whole website locally, I had to create like this symlink factory that was like 17 symlinks of trunk on, it was, it was pretty weird. Um, another challenge the New York Times was that we don't use WordPress comments. Um, and the New York Times is a very heavily commented site. There's an entire team called CRNR that handles that. We also don't use WordPress media, which is ironic because I spent a lot of time on WordPress media, uh, and we use none of that. And there's a whole different CMS at the Times called Scoop, and the media lives there. We don't use WordPress native post locking, and when I was at the Times, uh, when I started there in 2013, we were building 3.6. 3.6 wasn't even out yet, so post locking came out while I was there, and we've actually uh, yet to reconcile the two different um, systems, which is unfortunate. But um, that's kind of indicative of the Times being a very early adopter of WordPress. Um, the Times was using WordPress before there were widgets. They were using WordPress before there were shortcodes. So the Times started using shortcodes, but shortcodes did not exist in WordPress. So there's a lot of very creative um, regular expressions throughout the code base that I've tried to retire over time. Um, but it's, it's very hard um, when you have this amount of technical debt, you know, we have stuff we're constantly working on. We aren't stopping every day to refactor all of our code based on what WordPress is doing currently. Um, so yeah, and there's also a layer for bylines. You know, we don't use, the users in WordPress are not authors. They're the people who are going in and, and perhaps uh, producing the content. But there's a whole LDAP system um, that we use to authenticate users. And um, the users themselves exist in a different system. 
Okay, so uh, it was a tough four or five months, but what was good is that the Times was already working on something called NYT5, which was the next generation version of the New York Times code base. Um, and so my arrival there kind of coincided with this project that was already happening. So to explain uh, visually the difference between what they used to call NYT4 and NYT5, um, this was NYT4. And you know, for the universe, this is what the New York Times looked like. And then one day we had NYT5. And uh, when you go to the New York Times now, what you're seeing is what we call NYT5, which was the redesign. And if you see the new homepage, it's the redesigned homepage. NYT5 has its own new set of challenges, uh, which your development on the platform, it demands this vagrant environment. Um, and your GitHub repo for the app actually can't run as a website until you do a bunch of transpiling uh, with Grunt. Um, and so what happened to me is I got tasked to do what they call the NYT5 theme. And I think some people thought, oh, it's going to be the same thing. We're going to have our version of the markup, and then we'll, we'll pull in these global styles and global JS and be on our way. Well, that wasn't really going to happen because uh, the JS and CSS are SAS and require, and they're dynamically built based on the app and based on your um, vagrant or build environment. Um, and there is no like one file you can just point at and have like the global styles for the New York Times. Um, and also, they started using uh, Composer and you know PHP 5.5 object-oriented uh, magic everywhere, which is fine. Uh, but we have a problem with WordPress that WordPress cannot uh, for a variety of reasons. So Require.js was an upgrade for us regardless of any challenges it uh, presented because it fixed the jQuery problem. Require.js allows you to specify the dependency and then through dependency injection give you that um, whatever was exported in a callback. So while I don't recommend you do this, uh, require.js makes it safer to do this. So that, ne that wasn't necessarily a bad thing to go to require.js. Um, but the deal breakers were, we can't just point um, our domain at WordPress and let WordPress figure everything out. We actually had to um, point at our NYT5 blogs app, pipe that to WordPress. You know, WordPress has to, um, figure out what the content's supposed to be, and then let the, this NYT5 framework uh, trickle down and do its thing. I'm not going to go too much into detail on this. I'll show you a um, slide that kind of explains this. But our web server is eventually going to hit, uh, this is a drastically simplified version, but app.php is going to load some initial files, bootstrap WordPress, capture the content, and then initialize the application. And the application will have access to whatever WordPress output. Um, this is not an ideal setup, but it allowed us to continue using WordPress um, in an environment where brand new modern web apps were being created. Uh, and WordPress did, wasn't uh, immediately suited to work that way, but I was able to find a way for the two systems to work. Um, and the, the advantages here, we have those shared modules. Our theme itself doesn't have to produce the entire HTML document. It's one of those things where if we're already provided a best in class wrapper for our content and we can uh, in some form inherit that and not branch their logic, let's do it. Um, and then the irony is because everything else is namespaced, we actually don't have any collisions in global scope because <laughs> modern PHP apps don't use global scope. WordPress uses almost exclusively global scope. So the strange thing is that in your NYT5 app somewhere, you can use any WordPress stuff you want. Um, yeah, so this is how we made WordPress work in this new environment. Globals, uh, I just want to take a pause for a second and just uh, highlight the fact that globals are not the future of PHP. I don't know if they ever were, but globals are, are a thing that uh, is pervasive across WordPress. If you aren't familiar with them, uh, Globals can be created in a variety of ways, but number one is if you have top level code, meaning you have a PHP file and you do dollar something, you have just hoisted that variable into global scope. If you directly alter the globals super global, you've created a variable in global scope. If you have imported a global 
uh, like I have in this function, I'd have to check, but I'm pretty sure that creates a global equal to null. But um, all of these things are bad way to actually handle state, but it is a um, kind of a benchmark of WordPress. So uh, this could be solved uh, kind of across the board, but we have uh, the necessity to support PHP 5.2. PHP 5.3 introduced namespaces, and namespaces are great for this, this very reason. Um, but even if we do go to PHP 5.3, the next day we aren't going to refactor WordPress to use namespaces because nothing, uh, no code written anywhere else is in this paradigm. Um, and namespaces, if you've never seen them, uh, I can declare WP, and then instead of having to have WP underscore query, I can create a query class. But another namespace could also create a query class uh, within that namespace scope. Um, anyways, uh, the NYT5 was a ne necessary thing to not uh, have WordPress eradicated the New York Times because it actually would have been way easier to just ditch our old installation of WordPress completely and go with something proprietary that didn't involve blogging at all. But I didn't want to make I didn't want that to, that to happen. We made the NYT5 thing happen, but blogs overall were in a general transition and kind of rightfully so. A good example of this is blogs were duplicating section fronts. Um, Mark Bittman uh, was a food writer. He's actually, I don't know if he already left the Times, but he's leaving the Times. Uh, he had a column in the paper. His column exists in the web as an article. He contributes to a blog. There's a section front for dining. He also has bitman.blogs at mytimes.com. Like, why? Right? There's, it doesn't make total sense these things were there. And, and a lot of times, it was just an express lane for uh, pushing out content. And in an ideal world, all content goes through the rigor of the New York Times editorial process. Um, the problem here was that blogs, blogs and WordPress became combined in everybody's mind. And so when they go, blogs are going away, they'd hear WordPress and they're like, oh, well, WordPress is going away. We're not going to use WordPress, which was scary, which is why I've put the hashtag dark at the end there. Um, but we still had a few things that were uniquely suited to WordPress. Um, first draft is, and I wrote a long blog post about this about a year ago, but um, things we take for granted in our systems, you know, the New York, the MIT5 system, there's an app for article, which means uh, URL patterns that match article. There's an app for homepage. There's an app for these um, collections type URLs. They don't have stuff like day archives, right? They would have to invent day archives in their system, month archives, date query, the ways we can kind of, like kind of do these sophisticated queries based on all kinds of parameters. Um, we had to build first draft in WordPress because the other system couldn't handle it, right? And it sounds kind of strange because for us, day queries are an afterthought, who cares, right? But you get so much of this stuff for free. Um, we have these things in New York Times called collections. Collections are actually just terms. You know, the taxonomy and term URLs and rewrites we get for free. Uh, they've been spending months trying to figure out how to replicate that kind of stuff in the proprietary CMS and then represent it in a front end app that has to parse these URLs. It's these apps that um, render the content are not front end and back end. They're front end only that read JSON and they weren't started with the paradigm of having a way to query this other system for these, um, this group of content. And the content itself may not have been logically uh, associated anyways. Um, we have Lens, which is a photography blog I mentioned that um, Eric Lewis actually worked on. And then we have what we call live coverage. Um, if you've never seen first draft, this is first draft. We expect people to come here and get their uh, Washington news fix, perhaps leave the page open all day. And there's a um, backbone component that will load in um, new updates. This uses the REST API, but it's, it's kind of a very primitive thing. It just it pings the um, post endpoint. And if there's new items, it plops it in. Um, this is the front page of Lens. And in 2014, um, the midterm elections came up and they required, they asked me to make changes to our existing um, live blogging tools. And our live blogging tools were um, written in 2008, kind of written before, you know, that was kind of the dawn of jQuery, if you think. That they stopped even thinking about like backbone or require or something like that. Like we had code that was written, you know, two or three years before custom post types. And so, 
you know, at the time, it actually may have been a sophisticated solution where you had custom tables and you had code that may have duplicated what um, post APIs may have done. But um, it was one of those things. Are we supposed to launch a couple hundred live blogs and then two years later completely re rewrite them, pause, rewrite them in uh, custom post types, support all the old live blogs and maybe port that content over? It's a huge undertaking. Um, so yeah, I kind of mentioned this stuff. And then we tried a different thing where instead of doing that, perhaps we'd spin a, you know, we're using multi-site, perhaps spin a new blog up when we would do a new live blog. But that kind of sucks because the event may only be four hours long. And a blog, every time you spin a blog up, you're actually creating 10 new database tables. So if, you, if for every 10 events you have, you're gonna have 100 new database tables, it's, it's kind of hairy. So the question was what if we could use stuff like custom post types um, and to create a new live blog rather than creating this you know, huge thing or, or creating custom tables, maybe we'll create something called an event, which is an object type because we have custom post types now, and that event itself can have updates, another custom post type. Um, and it, even if you don't want to use WordPress for the front end, let's say somebody wants to make a Node.js app or a Rails app, because we uh, were aware of this REST API that was being created, back then it was being called the JSON API, um, because this was V1, um, you know, this was a great use of WordPress to be a backend that was kind of bridging a gap um, for systems that didn't have this capability. So we could provide REST, we could provide self-service URLs, um, but we didn't actually care if we were the front end or not. So I, over the course of a, kind of a weekend, built this screen which is a different admin. You know, it's, this is a one-page Backbone app, and the reason I picked Backbone is because Backbone speaks REST out of the box. On top of that, um, even when it was called WPJSON API, there was already a Backbone um, client that knew how to talk, that knew how to model the objects that the um, JSON API provided, and it was actually really easy. Um, to set up the boiler, boilerplate code to like have some fields, save them to an endpoint, get the um, post back in an editable form, et cetera. And then on the right over here, we're reading the stream of posts, and I have that using Heartbeat as well um, to update when, you know, when I, I ping it maybe every five or seven seconds and it pulls in the new posts in whatever state they're in. Maybe they're in draft or maybe they're in um, publish and there's post locking. Um, but it became very easy once I was using tools that spoke REST to each other uh, to put this stuff together. So uh, let's go over here. So yeah, what we did is we created a thing called Live Events. If you ever go to the NewYorkTimes.com slash live something, it's WordPress. Uh, it was a brand new admin interface. We use custom REST endpoints to handle processes. And um, WordPress serves the front end. I have a slide coming up that breaks it down a little bit, but um, we actually have a WebSocket on the front end too that once we're doing an event, um, listens for, um, you know, it has a WebSocket um, listener and we'll actually use React to um, put in posts. React is a big buzzword these days. And um, it's great for things like live blogging. I'm not so sure it's great for traditional blogging because um, if you create a post about apple pie, that post isn't really gonna update perhaps ever. But a live blog is by nature gonna update all the time, which is, the, which is why React's a good thing to use. Um, this kind of took off like gangbusters and is now the de facto platform for breaking news of the New York Times. Also for covering stuff like uh, events that lend themselves to live blogging, like the Grammys here. Um, great post at the top. And then we also made it responsive. The uh, website itself, the New York Times, is not responsive down to small screen sizes. Um, but we made this responsive so that um, a lot of New York Times posts, um, when you hit them, if they can tell you're on a phone, actually go to a, a mobile, mobile website. Um, if you're on your mobile phone and you're watching live coverage, you're watching it uh, responsive on WordPress the whole time. OK. So we also have um, something else we need to do when we have live events is we have to put modules on things like article pages. And the article pages, uh, this is in our other CMS, we kind of point it at one of our JSON feeds. And um, this will also like live update. 
anyways, because we did start doing this Word, WordPress stuff that was less blogs related and uh, more agnostic to technology, we joined the interactive news team uh, beginning of this year. We have more freedom down there, and it turns out we want to use Docker instead of Vagrant. Uh, PSR0, which is being used by MIT5, is now obsolete because PSR4 exists. Um, we're using Gulp for a lot of things instead of Grunt. Require.js is just fine, but we actually prefer to use Browserify. Uh, PHP is cool, but why can't we use stuff like Node and React occasionally? Um, so yeah, the, this team is very independent. You can use whatever language you want, and you don't have to use NYT5 um, for a lot of these projects. So the live coverage platform, any URL in the Times that does this, uh, nytimes.com live event, Request is served by WordPress with PHP markup. React wraps the post area. WebSocket. Updates can be added by WordPress, or they can actually be added by a client that was written by somebody else on our team in Slack. We actually have a workflow where reporters for an entire event may be in Slack. And um, the mod Slack extension we built allows uh, WordPress posts or these Slack posts to be pushed into something called Invisible City, which is a service we created. Um, that uses uh, Redis and Pusher, and that's actually what interacts with our WebSocket. Um, and so whenever we get updates, React can update that content. So Elections Code became break good for breaking news. Uh, so yeah, for WordPress and REST, we're not doing any rocket science. We're registering routes, and then we are handling the routes. A few things I want to mention that will be got yes for just plugin developers in general is most plugins in the WordPress ecosystem, uh, if you make a custom menu page and you want to handle like a form submission or something, almost everything just looks at post. And so it'll say, oh, if it's not a post, I must be a get request, just return or something. Uh, REST is going to speak all kinds of HTTP verbs. And so you may get delete and post and put requests. So those need to be handled as well. So if you were doing post on equal to server method. Now you want to do if it's get return so that you can actually receive any other kind of request. When using the REST API, WordPress becomes basically a REST service. And the WordPress code base is not, I'd say, the greatest thing to use as a web service platform. Um, and that's something we're going to be working on as we uh, look at adding endpoints to WordPress. But um, something you need to be aware of. Also with HTTP, you don't want to make a lot of those requests serially to the REST API. You have to look at concurrency, using tools like Guzzle to do um, multi-HTTP. Another thing we're going to look at in 4.5 uh, with Ryan McHugh and Dion is looking at um, overhauling our WP HTTP internals to support multi-requests. Um, and, and one thing to know about the New York Times, some secrets I'll tell you, we do, do not hit the REST API on the, the home page of the New York Times. If we have a module, on publish, we actually take the JSON response and throw it into Akamai, and we ping those Akamai URLs. Um, this isn't always necessary, but for breaking news in the New York Times, it's been necessary for us every time. And finally, uh, HTTP in general is time consuming, so the um, you're going to want to build these admin interfaces that do things like safe posts, but then you're going to have plugins that are actually hooking into safe posts a bunch of times. Safe posts may actually make HTTP calls. Um, this is pretty bad because it can actually really, like, really slow down the, um, number one, your page load in the admin, but your REST responses will feel real slow. We started using a technique called fire and forget where we pass only the context we need um, to a remote request, and then it, we kind of make it asynchronously. We don't care if we get the response or not, because we want to let another endpoint handle um, this logic. Uh, I don't have enough time to go too deep into this. Anybody can grab me on the side and talk to me about it. But uh, this is uh, a big part of our custom endpoints uh, in our admin. And I'm going to post all these slides. I think I'm basically out of time. But uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Five minutes? Yeah, cool. So we have five minutes for questions. That's, I guess that's the end of my talk, but uh, if anybody has any questions about anything, let me know. <laughs> that's, that's also the first time I've ever made it through all my slides. I'm usually like flicking like. <laughs> Just a quick easy one. How does the REST API and the live blogging affect your uh, analytics? 
Because I know that's going to be a question I'm asked if I pitch this. Okay, you know what? Great question. Um, you, know, you know what it affects more is um, the thing we had to spend the most time on was um, SEO type stuff. Um, especially with dynamic uh, sites like that, we do have uh, URLs and like linking that you can deep link to stuff. And like even though live updates are dynamic, you can deep link to them. But um, for SEO, we actually had to start using um, Amazon SQS and do um, or SNS. And we created an SNS topic that we post to. So when we, um, and this ties into the fire and forget stuff I was talking about, when we save an update or an event, we actually send an event to an SNS queue that our search team listens to. And when they receive that message, they actually dynamically update stuff like um, sitemaps and stuff. And so when these live events are going on, we have like an audience development team who's staring at Google and Google News and making sure that the second we do an update, it's very quickly at the top of Google. Like we're thinking about that stuff constantly. And um, stuff like Google Rich Snippets and um, what's the mobile initiative? Um, AMP is the. Yeah, that, that, yeah, they've already we've already, we've already started working on them, like that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you have to be cognizant of um, we're definitely cognizant of that kind of stuff, and we also do have tons of custom Google Analytics stuff firing for various things. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? All right, thank you.